Uh, welcome to our first event in the Spring Speaker Series. We are super excited that Cole Newstomer is here to talk to us today. I have a couple of super brief announcements before we get started. Uh, our next event is a month from today on Thursday, April 30th. So Dan Hubbard, the CTO of OpenDNS, is going to be talking about their use of visualization for security and threat analysis, and it will be super interesting, so you'll be going to that. And let's see. There's so much stuff to say about Cole. She has a super interesting background. She's done a lot of, um, contributed a lot to the field, so we're really excited that she's here. I'm not gonna give a super long introduction because you're already excited about her. That's why you're here. Uh, but she just told me she just finished her manuscript for her new book, so maybe we could do a round of applause for that. <laughs> so that's awesome, that book. Um, you know, put it on your, your wish list, do your pre-orders or whatever now. It's called Storytelling with Data, a Data Visualization Guide for Business Professionals. It's going to come out in the fall, published by Wiley. So that's great. She obviously uh, also travels the country delivering presentations and doing trainings, um, workshops with um, private companies and philanthropic organizations, and she teaches in the Information Visualization Master's Program at MICA. So we're super excited that Cole is here. Uh, please hold your Q&A uh, questions for the end. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. Quick special thanks to the <coughs> Dean's Office and the College of Arts and Sciences for funding this event, helping put all this stuff together, especially Chris Harris, <coughs> Associate Dean, and Lisa Loxon in the Dean's Office, who helped out with the, the food and catering and everything. Uh, Rosa Marina in Computer Science helped us a lot. Uh, Shaw Wang, who's one of the DataViz Meetup organizers, uh, helps us get the word out about these events, and he's actually here tonight. Usually he's in New York, so we're super excited, Shaw, that you're here among this sea of faces. I cannot pick you out. Uh, also, thanks to the amazing computer science students who volunteered to help check people into the door, put up posters, raising the roof back there in the corner, that's great. And uh, design student Andy Davies, who designed this image and the, um, the amazing promotional posters. So he's the manager of the Graphics Center, just like an on campus design house. They do really amazing work. And finally, thank you to Cole. Cole, here you go. Thank you, Scott, and big thanks to everybody who helped this event take place tonight. My name is Cole, and I like to think of what I do as telling stories with data. So I've done that over the past decade and some change at a few different organizations in a number of different roles, most recently at Google, where I worked on the People Analytics team. And People Analytics at Google is an analytics team that's embedded in Google's HR organization. So the goal there is to try to help ensure that people decisions, so decisions about employees or future employees, are data driven. So we frequently found ourselves in the situation where we needed to convince somebody to do something using data. And graphs and tables and other types of visuals can be fantastic for doing that when they're done by. So over time we developed some best practices. And one day I thought I should share these and developed a course on data visualization that I taught at Google for a number of years. And then one day I thought, I should share this further. Being able to communicate effectively with data is not a skill that's unique to Google, rather it's a skill that pretty much anybody could leverage to have more impact in their day-to-day -day work or school life. And so two years ago I jumped ship and left Google and have been spending my time since then talking to groups and teams and organizations and a uh, group such as you all tonight about what I've learned and what I'm learning when it comes to communicating with data in the specific use case where there is a story you want to tell with the data you want to show. And what we're going to go through tonight is a super condensed version of some of the content that I typically cover in a half day or a full day workshop. So I'll try to keep this high energy. I'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. And with that, we're gonna jump right in. So in school, we spend a lot of time learning about language and about math. On the language side, we learn how to read, how to write, how to put words together into sentences and into stories. And on the math side, we learn how to make sense of numbers. But it's rare that these two sides are paired. Nobody really teaches us how to tell stories with numbers. So one of the <coughs> things that ends up happening is we rely on our tools to understand best practices. And our tools, unfortunately, pretty easily let us do some kind of crummy stuff. 
a picture of a graph. We've all seen a graph that looks something like this before. Consider this a poor example of data visualization. There is a story here, but my graphing application, Excel in this case, doesn't know what that story is. That's where it takes me as the analyst or the communicator of the information to make that story so visually clear to my audience that they can't help but understand it, that they can't help but see what I want them to see and walk away with the message I want them to know. So come back to this specific example in a moment. In the meantime, I want to give you a more specific sense of how we'll spend our time together here tonight. So as I mentioned, this is a super condensed view, but my goal is still for you to walk out of this room with some really practical tips and tricks that you can start using immediately when it comes to communicating with data. We're going to talk through five key lessons. Start off briefly talking about context and the importance of having a really clear understanding of who your audience is and what you need them to know or do before you really start visualizing any data or creating any content. In the second section, we'll talk about some common types of displays and use cases for each. The third section, we'll get comfortable identifying and eliminating clutter the things that aren't adding informative value to our visuals and stripping those elements away. In the fourth section, we'll talk about how people see and how we can use things like color and size and the position on page to lead our audience through our information, to show them where to look. And then finally, we'll talk about story and the importance of embedding the data that we want to show in a robust narrative that makes it resonate with our audience. I'm not, as I mentioned, I'll leave some time at the end for Q&A, and that should take us right up to the point where everybody wants to get on home. So that, we're going to keep uh, going. Before I really start talking about data visualization, I want to spend a couple of minutes on context. And I'd like to draw one important distinction at this point, and that is the distinction between exploratory and explanatory analysis. So in exploratory analysis, you maybe start off with a question or a hypothesis, or maybe you have some new data that you want to explore. You're looking through it, combing through it, trying to figure out what might be interesting or insightful that somebody else might care about. Once you've identified the interesting or insightful things, then we move into explanatory space, where there is something specific you want to tell to somebody specific. It's this latter space we're going to be living in during our time together this evening. When it comes to explanatory analysis, there are a couple of questions that you should be able to really concisely answer before you really start visualizing any data or creating any content. First question is, who are you communicating to? Who is your audience? And the more specific you can be about who that audience is, the better position you put yourself in for being able to craft a communication or a data visualization that's going to resonate with that audience. If you can identify a specific audience, you can think about what motivates that audience. Are they motivated by making money, or beating the competition, or innovating? If you can identify what motivates your audience, then you can think about what you need them to do and how to frame that in terms of those motivating factors. This brings me to the second question that you need to be able to concisely answer, which is what do you want your audience to do? My view is when we are communicating with data for explanatory purposes, we should always want our audience to do something. And we should be working through our communication to make that something as crystal clear as possible. And so like, after we've answered these first two questions, who are we communicating to, what do we need them to know or do, that then we can turn back to our data and say, now given this context, what data do we have available that can act as evidence of this case that we're building? So to ground this in an example, uh, I'm going to put some context up here, have you read through it, and this is an example that we'll keep coming back to after each of the lessons that we cover here tonight, so you can see them grounded in a real world example. And this is a real example, I just anonymized it for purposes here. Let's go ahead and give that a scan, and then we'll talk about it. Folks, clear the context here. So we're going to start up 
you are working on a team that is helping do analysis to understand competitor pricing over time. And you've been asked to give a specific recommendation for the price of your product based on competitor analysis. And your teammate's gone ahead and actually pulled together the data and pulled together an initial view, and it looks pretty much like where we started off here tonight, which is not where we'll end up. But before we get too much into this and start thinking about how we could look at this differently, let's go back to our who, what, and how. So in this case, let's assume our audience is the decision maker, right? the person who's going to be deciding the pricing for our product. Let's assume in that, this case, that's the VP of product. And when we think about what we need the VP to know or do, first off, we want them to understand what the competitive landscapes look like over time. And then secondly, we're going to make a recommendation for pricing off of this. So we, we want them to accept the recommendation or take that recommendation as input in the eventual uh, price setting. And then when it comes to how data can help make our point, we can look at average retail prices of our competitive products over time, build that context, and have that lead up to our recommendation. So as I mentioned, we'll keep coming back to this example after each of the lessons <coughs> that we cover. But that was the super quick version of lesson one on context. And the really important thing is just to pause and think about who your audience is and what you need them to know or do before you start visualizing any data. But then once you've done that and you've got some data and you want to show it, comes the question of how do I do that in a way that's going to get my message across to my audience? Now there are a lot of different types of visuals, different types of graphs out there, uh, but it turns out a handful of them will meet the majority of your needs. I went back over my work over the course of a year and categorized every single visual that I made. And it was several hundred visuals. And I thought, wow, this is going to be like so many categories and have a really long tail, right? Because you need different graphs to work for different situations and different types of visuals. So I was surprised when I did it to actually find that 99% of what I created could be categorized into 12 categories. And there are 12 categories that you're probably mostly pretty familiar with. So I won't go through all of these, uh, but wanted to point out some highlights. So first off, when you have some data that you want to show, typically a table or a graph will be the first sorts of visuals that we think about. But before we get there, I want to spend a moment on the power of simple text. When you have just a number or a couple of numbers that you want to show, showing the numbers themselves can be a really powerful way to do so. Something about taking a number two or two and putting them in a table or a graph that beyond potentially being misleading just causes the numbers themselves to lose some of their own. So when you have just a number or a couple of numbers that you want to show, think about just using the numbers directly. When you have more data that you want to show, typically a table or a graph will be the way to go. One thing to understand is that people interact very differently with these two types of visuals. Let's check out tables first. Tables interact with our verbal system, which means that we read them. When I have a table in front of me, I typically have my index fingers out. I'm reading across rows, I'm reading down columns, I'm comparing values, and tables are great for just that. If you have a mixed audience who's each going to want to look to their own specific line of interest, or if you have many different units of measure, that can be easier to pull off in a table than in a graph. Graphs, on the other hand, interact with our visual system, and our visual system is much faster at processing information than our verbal system means that a well-designed graph is going to get the information across more quickly than a well-designed table. Let's check out some common types of graphs. Uh, first off, the scatter plot. Scatter plots are great when you have information you want to encode simultaneously along a vertical y and a horizontal x-axis. For example, if we imagine for a moment that we are a car manufacturer, one thing we might be interested in is the issues that are happening with our current models versus satisfaction. So here we can see on our y-axis on the left-hand side, things gone wrong, measured as the number of issues per thousand on a scale from few at the top to many at the bottom. And then across our x-axis, we have satisfaction, uh, measured as the percent that are satisfied or highly satisfied, ranging from low on the left to high. We can plot perhaps our prior year average and then get an understanding of how this year's models compare to our prior year average. 
Another type of common graph is the line graph. Oftentimes, lines are plotting some unit of time, and that is because line graphs should only be used for continuous data. You can imagine if we had categories on our x-axis here, we're imposing this visual connection between them that probably doesn't make any sense. So the rule is, with line graphs, make sure you're plotting continuous data. So get a specific example of a line graph. Here is passport wait time uh, for uh, a to be nameless West Coast airport. We can see <laughs> what the average has looked like on a monthly basis over time. Note here we've also plotted the minimum and the maximum. So in addition to our summary statistic, the average, you also get a, an understanding of the variance or the range over time. This can be a useful approach, by the way, if you are plotting a forecast and want to give some understanding of confidence limits or intervals around the forecast. You're not just showing the point estimate. A special case of the line graph is the slope graph. Quick show of hands, how many people in the room are familiar with the slope graph? Good portions, a little lesser known. So slope graphs are great when you have just two points in time. I think sometimes we don't often think about using a line graph when that's the case, but depending on your data, it can actually work really well. They pack in a lot of information in a pretty intuitive way. So here, for example, we have some employee feedback summarized over 2014 and 2015. So we can see really quickly both sort of the stack ordering of how we did across the various dimensions, and then also the rate of change between over time, which you can talk about without ever having to talk about rate of change because it's implicit via the relative slopes of the line. Now, whether a slope graph works sort of depends on the layout of your data. If you have a lot of crisscrossing lines, they can get pretty messy pretty quickly. Sometimes you can still emphasize just one or just a couple at a time and have that so work for the story you want to tell. So we talked about lines are for continuous data. When it's categorical data you've got, a bar chart is your very best friend. I think sometimes we avoid bar charts because they're common. My view is that's the wrong use case. We should use them and use them frequently because they're <coughs> common. It means our audience already knows how to read the graph. Bar charts are also really easy for our eyes to read. What our eyes are doing are comparing the respective endpoints of the bars. So it's easy to see quickly which category is the biggest, which is the smallest, also the incremental difference between categories. Number of types of bar charts. This is your standard vertical bar chart or column chart. Uh, another type of bar chart is the horizontal bar chart. The great use case here is if my category names are very long. It allows me to orient the text from left to right as most, if not all, of your audience members read. It makes your graph legible for your audience. We'll keep coming back to audience again and again and again throughout our time together here this evening because everything we're doing when it comes to communicating data is for that audience. So we want to keep that audience in mind and in general, try to identify anything that's going to feel like work and take that work upon ourselves as the designers of the information so that to our audience it just feels easy. Another type of bar chart is the stacked bar <coughs> chart. So great use case here. So I want to compare totals across different categories. And within a given category, I want some understanding of the subcomponent pieces. Less useful, though, if I want to start comparing those subcomponent pieces across categories as soon as I get past this first series, I no longer have a consistent baseline to use to compare. It's just a harder comparison, so something to keep in mind when you're using the stacked bars. Uh, an exception would be when you are using 100% stacked bars, because then you get the consistent baseline both along the bottom and along the top. Or in the case of a horizontal 100% stacked bar chart, you get a consistent baseline both on the left as well as on the right. For that reason, they can be really useful for showing survey data. For example, the survey data we have here plotted on a Likert scale, ranging from strongly disagree at the left to strongly agree at the right, where I can easily compare the strongly disagree and disagree segments across my very survey items by looking from the left across, or I can compare the positive end of the scale by looking from the baseline on the right leftward. While we're on the topic of bar charts, Let's look at an example from the media. So for this one, we have to imagine ourselves in the fall of 2012. We're looking forward to say, what's going to happen if the Bush tax cuts expire? On the left-hand side, we have
have the top tax rate now at 35%. On the right hand side, what if we go to on January 1st at 39.6%? Does anybody see any issues with this graph? <laughs> so this number that's small and on the right, maybe on purpose, I'm not sure, is not zero, but rather 34. Which means really these bars should continue down to, I don't know, the floor, maybe? And you can imagine how, if they were to do so, that relative difference between them looks a whole lot different than is portrayed here. In fact, this depicts a visual increase of 460% versus an actual increase of 13%. So the rule here is bar charts must have a zero baseline. Because of the way our eyes are comparing the endpoints, it means we actually need the context of the full bar there in order to do that accurately. Have you ever seen, sometimes I see also where there's an axis, a y-axis, and then it's broken, and there's sort of a zigzag to indicate a middle of the axis is missing? That's the same issue that we have going on here. Um, I often see that done in order to be able to compare numbers of very different magnitudes. Uh, my go-to chart when that is the case is the square area graph. So you can consider with bars you get either height or width, depending on what sort of bar chart you're using, versus with a square area graph you get height and width, which means that you can show numbers of different magnitudes in a more condensed space. For example, if we wanted to understand what health app users look like out of online adults or total adults, we could do so via a square area chart. So what we've looked at here is just a sampling of graphs. Like I said, it's the basic graphs that are going to help you out and satisfy most of your needs. And now you might notice that there's one common graph, we see them everywhere all the time, that is suspiciously, or maybe not so suspiciously given the title of my talk, absent from this list, <laughs> the pie chart. So let's spend a moment on pie charts. Let's actually look at an example. So here is the player market share across four suppliers, A, B, C, and D. If I ask you to make a simple observation based on this graph, which supplier makes up the biggest share of the market, which one would you say? B. Right, this uh, bottom right, sort of medium blue segment there. If you had to estimate what percent supplier B makes up of the overall market, what percent might you estimate? 36. A third, I heard 40, 36. You could probably tell by my leading questioning that that's not exactly <coughs> what's going on here. Yeah, so supplier A that looks smaller is actually bigger than supplier B. What's going on here? Perspective, 3D, I see people going like this, tilting. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Probably the worst offender is the 3D and this tilting perspective, making the top pieces appear farther away and the smaller than they actually are. The bottom of pieces appear closer, that's bigger than they actually are. There aren't a lot of hard and fast rules when it comes to data visualization. It sits at this really interesting intersection between art and science. But there are some rules, as we learned a moment ago, bar charts must have a zero baseline. Another rule I'll introduce now is never ever use 3D. <laughs> the only exception is if you're actually plotting a third dimension, and even then it gets very tricky very quickly, so take care. And never some, for something like this. Here we're making our data harder for our audience to get at. Why would we want to do that? The other thing we have going on here is humans' eyes have a hard time ascribing quantitative value to two-dimensional space. Said more simply, pie charts are hard for people to read. Our eyes don't do a good job of measuring angles, which is really what we're asking our audience to do. So you might say, okay, that's fine, but say I have some data that looks like this, how should I show it? I'll say if you're absolutely married to the idea of a pie chart, let's at least improve the pie chart. So here we flattened it, taken away that 3D perspective that was distorting the values. I've taken away the differences in color that weren't adding any information. I've organized the segment starting with the greatest at the top left and working clockwise around the pie from greatest to least. It creates a construct for my audience to use as they're interpreting the information. I've also labeled the segments directly, both with the numeric values, so there's no comparison, no question as to what that is, as well as the category and reducing that work going back and forth between the graph and the legend. 
but I also encourage you to think about not a pie chart. So here's the same data organized as a horizontal bar chart. Um, I should maybe give you one caveat, which is that you'll see a lot of horizontal bar charts from me because I think they're really easy to read. So here we can see not only conclusively that supplier A is the largest, but how incrementally larger it is than the others. Now, we lose one thing with this transition from pi to not a pi, which is this concept of there being a whole and thus pieces of a whole. I'm trying to show that here by um, having the total of 100% at the bottom. It's not a perfect solution, but it's one option to consider. And what I'd like to say is if you find yourself reaching for a pie chart, <coughs> just pause for a minute and ask yourself why. And if you can answer the question, you put enough thought into it to use the pie chart, but it shouldn't be one of the first graphs you reach for because of some of the interpretation challenges that we've talked about here. Now, as I mentioned, there are a lot of graphs out there. And when it comes to the question, which is, visual is the right one for me? I always encourage thinking back to what is it you need your audience to do? And then think about what visual is going to facilitate that in the most straightforward way. And there's a great way to see if the visual you've created is hitting your mark, which is create it, even just draw it on paper, and hand it to a friend or colleague, and have them talk you through their thought process, where they pay attention, what questions they have, what observations they are able to make can let you know pretty quickly whether the visual you've created is doing its job, or in the case where it isn't, give you pointers on where to concentrate your iterations. So let's go back now to the example that I introduced. Remember, you're on this, uh, your own startup. You're wanting to give input on product pricing depend, uh, based on the competitive landscape. Your colleague came to you with this lovely graph. And now we're trying to think about how do we turn this into a story? How do we start thinking about the story? Um, there's a lot going on here, so much that it's hard to really concentrate on anything. We do have one call out at the top, which is prices declined for all products on the market since the launch of product C in 2010. So that's maybe something to keep in mind as we're playing with this visual. So I'm going to go through a couple of iterations of this. First off, I'm going to take away all of the color so we can focus more easily on the trend over time. Now, in that initial call out, there was um, the observation that with the launch of product C in 2010, we saw decline. So let's highlight just 2010 forward so we can see if that's the case. So we see clear declines for product A and product B, but not really for the products that came on later. So we're probably going to want to revisit that headline. And now you may also be thinking, yeah, we're talking time here, so maybe we should be looking at this with a line graph. So let's keep the same layout for a moment, but turn it into lines. That gets us here. This view lets us easily see a trend for the given product, but makes it harder to compare. If we wanted to see what was going on across products over time, that becomes difficult. So here, our primary categorization is product and within that time. When I think about switching around that categorization so that our primary category becomes time, and then within that, we can see what's happening across the various products. Now, we're not done yet. We're going to keep coming back to this. In the meantime, I'm going to shift gears on to lesson three, which is about clutter. So if we picture a blank page or a blank screen, every single element you add to that page or screen takes up cognitive load on the part of your audience, it takes them brain power to process, which means we want to take a really discerning look to what elements we allow onto our page or onto our screen, and in general, try to identify anything that isn't adding informative value, or isn't adding enough informative value to make up for its presence, and strip those things away. So as part of our conversation on clutter, I want to introduce the Gestalt Principles of Visual Perception. The Gestalt School of Psychology set out in the early 1900s to understand how individuals perceive order in the world around them. What they came away with are the principles of visual perception, still regarded today as how individuals interact with visual stimuli. Talk about them here because of some of the, the direct applications on our tables and our graphs. First principle is proximity. We tend to think of objects that are physically close together as belonging to part of a group. One way we can leverage this principle is in tables. So here in the example at the top, simply by virtue of differentiating the spacing between dots, your eyes are on either across the rows in the first case or down the columns in the second case. Next principle is similarity. 
We tend to think of objects that are similar color, similar size, similar orientation, similar shape, as belonging to part of a group. So again, we can leverage this in tables, use it to draw our audience's eyes in the direction we want them to focus, and eliminating the need for additional elements like table borders to do so. Third principle is enclosure. We tend to think of objects that are physically enclosed together as belonging to part of a group. Note that it doesn't take a very strong enclosure to do this. Light background shading is often enough. One way we can leverage the enclosure principle is to draw our audience's attention to a certain part of our vision. Next principle is closure. So it's interesting to me. It says people like things to be simple and ordinary and fit in the constructs that are already in our head. So most two people, most people, excuse me, faced with those first two visually opposing stimuli, see a square with the center of the panel missing. Or similarly, a circle with a piece missing. So some of what the principles allow us to do are just question some of the things our graphing applications have historically done for us. Heavy borders, dark background shading. We can strip away those elements, and our graph still appears as part of a whole, and the data stands out more. Next principle is continuity. This one is similar to closure. It says if I take the objects in the first panel and I pull them apart, most people will expect to see what's shown in the second panel whereas it could as easily be what's shown in the third. So our eye likes to draw continuous lines, even where they may not explicitly exist. One way we can leverage this is in graphs. Figure, the, to think about what we can strip out without losing anything. So here in the example at the top, I've taken out the y-axis line altogether. Your eye actually still sees it because of the continuity of space between the text and the data. And as we saw in the previous example, as we strip unneeded elements away, our data stands out more. Final principle is connection. The connected property has a stronger associative value than similar color, similar shape. It's not typically stronger than enclosure, but that depends on the relative strength of the connection and the enclosure. So you can play with that one through thickness and darkness of lines to get the right sense of visual hierarchy that you're after. So a little theoretical there, let's ground this. Oh, actually, sorry. One way to use connected property frequently is in line graphs. Help our eyes make sense out of what is sometimes a whole lot of data. So we have a little theoretical there. Let's go back and ground this in our practical example. So after we changed to a single line graph in Excel, we ended up here. If we look at this now with an eye towards clutter, what can we get rid of? Borders, grid lines, points. We can get rid of a lot of stuff, right? Check out what happens if we start stripping some of these things away. So let's get rid of the chart border and the grid lines. So it's amazing to me how much those two steps alone do in terms of making my data stand out more. Now, grid lines, if your data is such that, or your audience is such that, you think they're going to want to trace their finger across and get to the accurate value, you can leave them there, but make them thin, make them gray, push them to the background. Do not let them compete visually with your data. And when you can, get rid of them altogether because your data just stands out so much more. Uh, in the next step, I'm going to get rid of all of these data markers. Remember, as we said, every single element adds cognitive load. So here's a whole lot of mental burden for no additional information. It's not to say never use data markers, but rather to say use them for a purpose and with a purpose, not because they automatically show up there when you make your graph. So let's get rid of those. In the next step, I'm going to clean up my axis labels. So you may have noticed some trailing zeros over here. One of my pet peeves. They make the numbers look more complicated than they are and yet carry no information. So we can get rid of those. We also have some diagonal years happening on our x-axis. Studies have shown diagonal text is about 50% slower to read than horizontal text. Vertical text, by the way, even slower. Uh, so the moral of the story here is avoid diagonal and vertical text as much as you can on your graphs. Here we've actually got space to fit them horizontally. So I don't know why they went vertical in the first place. Also, our tick marks aren't in line with the actual numbers, which just adds a bit of clutter that's unnecessary. So this next up, I'm going to clean up the axes, drop the trailing zeros, put the uh, dates horizontally, line them up with the tick marks. And now the remaining bit of burden we have here is this work going back and forth between the legend and the data. That's the sort of work that we want to identify and alleviate for our audience. So here we can do so through the Gestalt principle of proximity. Let's put the data labels right next to the data they describe. While we're leveraging proximity, let's think of also leveraging similarity. 
make the data labels the same color as the data they describe. It's just another visual cue that says to our audience, these two pieces of data are connected. Not done yet, but we are ready for lesson number four, which is about focusing attention. So I'm gonna start off by talking about how people see, super briefly at a very simplified level. Here's a picture of how we see. On the left-hand side, we have light refracting off the stimulus. It gets captured by our eyes. We don't fully see with our eyes. There's a little bit of processing that happens there, but mostly it's what happens in our brain that we think of as visual perception. In the brain, there are a couple of types of memory that are important to understand as we're designing visuals. We're going to talk about one of them tonight, which is iconic memory. Iconic memory is super short-term. It's shorter than short-term memory. The information stays there for fractions of a second before it gets forwarded on to our short-term memory. Really cool thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to a specific set of what we call pre-attentive attributes that are huge tools in our visual design tool belt. So let's actually do a little exercise here to demonstrate their power. So in a moment, I'm gonna put a bunch of numbers up on the screen. What I'd like you all to do as fast as you can is count the number of fives that you see. Do you know how many fives there are? Shout it out. It is a race and you would like to win. <laughs> Ready, set, go. <laughs> you are fast but inaccurate. Six. 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 So the correct answer is six. This was hard though, right? You have to physically read these four lines of text, look for five, which is kind of a complicated shape. Watch what happens though if I make one tiny change. Six, six right? You don't have time to think, don't have time to blink. Suddenly there are six fives in front of you. This is so apparent so quickly because I'm leveraging your iconic memory, using the pre-attentive attribute of intensity of color in this case to make the fives the one thing that stand out as distinct from the rest. And this is super cool because what this tells us is our pre-attentive attributes, if we use them strategically, can help enable us to get our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know they're seeing it. Here are the attributes. I won't read through all of these, but notice as your eye scans across the screen how you're just drawn to the one element within each box that looks different. You don't have to devote any conscious thought to looking for it. We can categorize pre-attentive attributes note I'm doing so here, through the pre-attentive attribute of color, into four categories. In blue, we have pre-attentive attributes of form. In green, pre-attentive attributes of color, spatial position, motion. One thing to understand about the attributes is that people tend to associate quantitative values with some, but not others. For example, most people consider a long line to represent a greater value than a short line. That's why bar charts are intuitive for us to read. We don't think of color, for example, in the same way. If I ask you which is greater, red or blue, it's not a meaningful question. This is important because it tells us which of the attributes can be used in code quantitative information and which should be used as categorical differentiators. Let's take a look at some examples using pre-attentive attributes. Uh, first one, some text. So this is a whole lot of text. You don't have to read it. It's not important what it says. The point is, if you wanted to get anything out of this, you would have to read it and then put on the lens of what's interesting or important, and then maybe read it again to put the interesting or important things back in context of first. It's the count the fives example all over again. But check out what happens as I use pre-attentive attributes selectively on the text. And notice as I do, how your eye is drawn with different strength to the different attributes. <clears throat> I can leverage both. <clears throat> uh, italics, color, size, capital letters, outline, I can underline, I can separate spatially, and now check out what happens when I use multiple pre-attentive attributes together. Suddenly you have something that is scannable. Studies have shown we have an order of three to eight seconds with our audience, during which time they're deciding whether they're going to continue to look at what we put in front of them or move on to the next thing. If we've used our pre-attentive attributes well, even if we only get that first three to eight seconds, we've gotten our main message across. Pre-attentive attributes are hugely useful at doing two things. First is drawing our audience's attention to where we want them to look. And second is creating this sense of visual hierarchy, almost implicit instructions to our audience that say, this is most important, look here first. This is next most important, look here next. And so on and so forth. 
So it's an example with some text. Let's also look at an example with some data. So this bar chart shows our annual customer survey results across a number of dimensions. Without any visual cues, you're left to process all this information. It's almost like the count the fives example or the block of text all over again. But if I have a story that I want to tell you, I can use pre-attentive attributes paired with some text to do that very quickly. So we can focus on the positive end of what's going on. Or I can use the same broad strategy to tell a completely different story. This can be a useful approach, by the way, when you're giving a live presentation. If you have data that you want to introduce once, talk your audience through what they're looking at, and then talk about different facets of it, <coughs> having your audience focus on just the pieces that you're talking about as you're talking through them, but preserving the rest for context. So let's look back now to the example we've been working our way through with our product prices in the competitive landscape. So we have a lot of pre-attentive attributes happening here, and a lot of color especially, but the problem is when so much is calling out for our attention, nothing stands out. So one of the ways I like to start is by pushing everything to the background. So it forces me to then make thoughtful decisions about what I highlight and what I draw attention to. So remember, if we think back to that initial call out, it was about what happened when product C was launched in 2010. So you can think about drawing emphasis there. And then we see a clear decrease in prices for product A and B that were already on the market. But with this view, we can see perhaps some more interesting things. For example, with the introduction of a product in this space, we tend to see a price increase followed by a price decrease. And by the way, 2014 and our latest data point relative to the sort of span we've had in prices over time, we're actually relatively condensed here. Any of these could be the right points of emphasis, depending on the story we want to tell. Which brings me to our final lesson of the evening, which is around story. And when I'm thinking story, I'm thinking full on children's book story. For example, <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood. Folks familiar with the story of Little Red Riding Hood? So a little thought exercise. Let's take, and we'll do this quickly, just 10 seconds, long enough for me to get a drink of water, for you to think about the story of Little Red Riding Hood for yourself. Think specifically about the plot, the twists, and the ending. And we'll come back together and talk about the relevance. 10 seconds here. Words. 
I think sometimes when we think about data this, we think words don't have a place. Words have a very important place in making the data we want to communicate accessible to our audience. There are some words that have to be there. Every graph needs a title, every axis needs a title, no matter how obvious you think it is from context. Don't assume that two different people looking at the same data visualization are going to walk away with the same conclusion. Which means, if there is a conclusion you want your audience to reach, you should state it in words. And use what we know about creative attributes to make those words stand out. Make them big, make them bold, put them in high priority places on the page like the top. Speaking of which, stories have words, annotate with text. This title bar in PowerPoint is precious real estate. It is the first thing our audience encounters when they see our page or our slide, and yet so often gets used for descriptive titles. Think about using that space for active titles. If there is a key takeaway, put it there so your audience can't miss it. Also works to set up the detail that's to follow on the rest of the page. Let's take a quick look at an <coughs> effective use of words. This is a visualization done by David McCandless in the UK. Pink break of times according to Facebook status <laughs> updates. So you see, close to the beginning of the year, we get spring break, peaks, uh, April Fool's Day, Mondays for some reason are popular for breakups. Not sure what sort of debauchery happens over the weekend. Gentle rise and fall over summer holiday. And then leading up to Christmas, this massive uptick in breakups. <laughs> Family stress, shopping stress. But then a nosedive at Christmas because breaking up with somebody, that would just be kind of mean. <laughs> Notice, in this case, how just a few choice words and phrases make this data so much more quickly accessible than it otherwise would be. When we think about the stories that we want to tell with our data, we want to think back to the things that we talked about with Little Red Riding Hood, the plot, the twists, and the ending. The plot becomes what context is essential for our audience to know so that they're ready to take in the information that we want to provide. Then the twists, what's interesting about the data. By the way, if there isn't anything interesting about the data, don't show the data. You lose, it sounds obvious, right? This happens a lot. And you run the risk of losing your audience's attention for when you do have something interesting to say. <coughs> and then finally, our ending, the call to action. Remember, my bias is we should always want our audience to do something. And we should be working through our data visualization and the corresponding communication to make that something as clear as possible. So let's go one final time back to the example we've been working our way through. So we ended here. Let's start by adding the words that have to be there, axis titles mainly. And now let's think about the story we want to tell, the progression that we want to take our audience through as we teach them about what's happened in the competitive landscape and bring forth our recommendation. So let's assume that we have five minutes on a meeting agenda to talk about this and to put forth our case. I could start by setting expectations with my audience of what I'm going to cover. So my goals are twofold. First, I want you to understand how competitive pricing in the marketplace has changed over time. And secondly, I'm going to make a recommendation based on this of how we should price our product, knowing that this is just one of the many uh, inputs that will go into that decision-making process. And we're going to end with a specific recommendation for you. Now, first I want to introduce what we're going to look at before I even stick any data there. So we've had products in this competitive market from 2008 going forward. And that's shown along the x-axis here. On the y-axis, we have average retail price. So if we look at how this has played out over time, products A and B were the first on the market. They both turned out with price points over $360. And if we track what's happened with them over time, they followed similar trajectories, which with A always priced slightly higher than B. And as of the latest data point, they've pretty much converged, right? 260 and 250 respectively. But we had some interesting things happen in the meantime, which are a bunch of other products come on at much lower price points. But we've seen all of them increase over time. And actually, in general, when we look at the launch of a product in this market space, we typically see an initial price increase followed by an eventual decline, whereby lately we've actually had quite a bit of convergence in the market. Our entire range across these products is from 180 to 260. Based on this analysis, we think we should price in the 200 or 150 to 200 range, just a little bit below the current average. So my story could look something 
like this. And when we consider where we started with the graph that our teammate asked us to critique, we've come a long way, both with the data visualization and with the narrative and the story that we put around it. It took us coming in and applying lessons that we've talked about tonight, having a robust understanding of the context, choosing an appropriate visual display, eliminating clutter, drawing attention where we want it, and finally telling a story that allows us to move from this space from simply showing data to maybe an observation or two, to making data a pivotal point in a story that we want to tell. So that is the meat I have for you this evening. We have some time now for questions. fit into all of this? Great question. So infographics are an interesting beast. And, and they run the gamut, right? From the, and, and what people mean when they say infographics run the gamut. Uh, the perspective or the sort of spectrum that I have in my head is on one side, it's the sort of fluffy marketing portions of little men filled in lots of different statistics on a given topic, but sometimes very little actual data or information. The other end of the spectrum, in my opinion, is infographics that actually inform. Uh, great examples in the media include uh, National Geographic or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times do a great job of these. You know, they're oftentimes very dense information that isn't overwhelming and allows you to sort of sit with the visualization and create insights for yourself in uh, an easy way. And so for me, for me, it's about story or the ability to be able to get at a story. And to the extent that an infographic helps with that, that's a great thing. Um, I think sometimes that's not the case. Um, I'm going to stop talking about that right now. <laughs> Thanks. I'm curious about bar charts. You said always show zero, show the full scale. Um, don't charts or line charts. Like, can you skew that in the same one? Yeah, great question. So the rule is with bar charts, you have to have a zero baseline. With line charts, you can get away with not having a zero baseline. So with bars, we're comparing the endpoints relative to the axis. So you need the whole bar there. With line graphs, we're comparing points relative to each other in time. 
and the slopes, the relative um, rises and falls over time, or over whatever the um, continuous variable is, and that you can get away with zooming in and still have those relationships hold. So I want to be careful about doing so, and specifically careful about over-zooming and making minor differences or minor changes appear significant. I saw a great example, there's nothing to write on, so I'll try to describe it recently, which was two graphs side by side, where the first graph showed the scale on, say, 0 to 100, and it was this line up at 100 where you could hardly see any movement. But then the next iteration, it was zoomed in from like 90 to 100, where you could see the peaks and valleys. So you've got both the big picture and all the context with the full scale as well as the zoomed in version, which I thought was kind of a nice way of handling that. To answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, one of your visualization types was waterfall. <coughs> Explain when you use that. Sure, yeah, we didn't uh, go into waterfalls. Waterfalls, I find mostly useful when you've got a beginning point and then additions and deductions over time and then an ending point. Uh, so for example, in the area of people analytics, you look for a team at the beginning of your head count and then you have um, hires or promotions or other things, transfers in, adding to that head count and then deductions. So people are trading or transferring out to other, team, other teams and then you have your end um, thing there. It's almost like taking the stacked bar chart and pulling it apart horizontally. And the super brute force way to do it, because it's not a functionality that's built into a lot of tools, is you use a stacked bar where your bottom bar, the one closest to the axis, is invisible. So you can, it takes a little bit of math to set up, um, but is a sort of brute force way to do it. Great question. Uh, I'm sort of new to this, and uh, one of the things I see a lot in my researching is this bar chart versus versus pie chart question that you brought up. And I usually see the same kind of narrative around it. Bar charts are bad because people can't compare angles or because pie charts are bad, excuse me. And um, that, uh, you know, color is an unnecessary extra bit of information that can mislead. But I'm wondering, are you familiar with any actual research that has compared uh, the takeaway people get from bar charts and pie charts. Do we do we actually know this, or are we just sort of putting together a narrative and guessing from it? Great question. And one of the hard things I find about research in the data visualization space is that you can find research that backs up pretty much either side of any <coughs> debate you have. I don't know if anybody knows of good research in this area off the top of their head. Um, <laughs> Um, no, I think that probably your, where you're going with your questioning is correct in that it's more, um, uh, I'm totally missing a word that I'm trying to think of at the moment, sorry, um, that it's more anecdotal than scientifically proven. Um, folks, have a, anyone in the room have a perspective on this they want to share? There's one second. There is a lot of of research and a lot of uh, experimentation trying to measure uh, attention, memory, uh, from, from data coming from bar charts and pie charts. And generally speaking, bar charts win in the sense that people remember the numbers. But then my, my personal perspective is that there is something that is extremely difficult to research, to measure, which is the sense of what they call the proportion to measure. What kind of question can you have someone about this gestalt field, right? Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that I intuitively decide to continue using not only pie charts, but other types of graphs in which what you see is part of the whole, creating the whole. Even if, I think the question you have to, to make yourself whenever you have to decide is, it's the figure is the number, is the quantity what is important in, in the message? Or is just the, the, the sharing the idea of there is a whole that has been somehow segmented by, for instance, people? I mean, if, if the answer is the second, I think, I think like pie charts would work. Great, thanks, Santiago. Sure. Uh, there was a, uh, there's a study a few years ago, like, you know, Tufty, obviously. Um, uh, they took a Tufty type of, you know, a Tufty, uh, they took one of his things and, uh, and he used the, the fame constantly, the USA Today graphics, the, you know, the infographics. And there's a small study from a, a CHI, HCI, human computer interaction group, 
did a small study and they actually did like a story, you know, comparing a Tufty style thing with a USA infographic. And the people remember, small study, so I don't know how good it is, how big the end was. People will remember the USA Today infographic one better. And so it was more favorable, at least that's what I heard. And I also noticed I saw Tufty speak after this came out. He dropped that entire reference to the USA Today infographic and the one that I saw. In <laughs> Not the first one I saw, but that one. What? What for? Uh, it was a talk. It was, a he was actually he, he was was omitted. The only thing that had changed in ten years. Yeah, there there was a slew of research because yeah, there have been studies showing that actually the more crap you add on, the better retention there is. But right, again, right. Then the counter study yeah. comes out, and there this is a space where there is so much opportunity for us to learn more. I think about human cognition. Um, for me, at a practical level, it comes back to what Santiago was talking about, which is what do you need your audience to know? What are you trying to say? And then how do you do that in a way that's going to feel intuitive and feel easy? Um, and you have some leeway when it comes to making that call. Awesome discussion. Other questions? What if you have a ton of data and you want to provide it all to your, your user and have them find out the information they want? So you don't package it, but also. Yeah, great question. Um, I find that we often want to do that when really we maybe should be taking it a step further. There's, there's, uh, there's a desire when we do an analysis or when we've got data that we want to share to want to turn it all over to our audience, to say here audience is everything look at it, figure out what's important or relevant to you, and sort of do with it what you will. Uh, which, in general, and there'll be different use cases, um, but in general I feel is a little bit dangerous because if you're not analyzing the data, you're actually in a really great position to be helping interpret it and helping provide those stories to go around it. Also, it's really easy if you're just handing over data for your audience to say, oh, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing. Versus if you're telling a story or you're asking for action, even if it's the wrong story or your audience disagrees with the action, it starts a conversation. And it's a conversation that often doesn't happen when it's simply a matter of sharing the data. Um, so if, if you're feeling like you're doing more of the sharing the data and less of the storytelling, one easy thing to test out is try putting more stories around it. Or at least pull the interesting stories or the interesting things you want to communicate up front and state them in words so that they don't get lost in all of the data. Great question. Yeah. I have a special request after this. Okay. Hi, I'm Yorika. So I've been doing a personal project for a couple of years ago. So I recorded all my activities in Google Calendar for about one year and a half. And then I decided, so in the end, I had like averages for day-to-day -day activities. And so I had about 15 categories in the end. I ended up, and I did a pie chart, like the whole day, and then activities like sleep, work, study, family time, cooking, tidying, socializing, and all that. And I decided to do like the pie chart for that. Do you recommend that it would be better? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on, again, what story you want to tell. <coughs> Yeah, it absolutely depends on story. So me personally, if I had that data on myself and I were grabbing it, I would not choose to put it in a pie chart. That doesn't mean you can't put it in a pie chart, certainly. Uh, it depends, again, what, what do you want to be able to get out of it? What do you want to see? And if what you want to see is, you know, if you want to just be able to highlight the time you spend exercising or the time you spend cooking, look at those things once, you know, one at a time over a broad range of days. That could be a way to do it, but it's all coming back to what do you want? What do you want to do with that? What sort of questions you want to answer, and how do you look at it in a way that's going to help answer those questions? And probably it's not just one view. Probably there are a lot of different views you could use to answer different questions, or different views you could use to answer the same questions. Some of it's playing and looking at things one way, and then looking at them another way, and then looking at them another way, and see what insights you come up with or what interesting things you find. Um, if you're unsure, seeking feedback from somebody else is always a good idea. Just put one of the graphs in front of somebody else and watch their facial muscles. Uh, can be like people. There's like a split second before people are guarded, where if there's utter confusion, you can see it on their face. Uh, so put it in front of somebody else and watch for that reaction and have them talk you through their thought process. 
what they pay attention to, what observations they're able to make, where they focus, what questions they have. Um, and if you're unsure, try looking at things a few different ways. When I'm refining from like, if I have a point where I think, okay, things look pretty good, but maybe some minor changes might make them even better, I often apply the optometrist approach, where I make a copy of my latest and greatest, uh, or I have a copy of my latest and greatest, and then I make a copy of it, and I make one minor change. And often by seeing them both side by side, I can figure out which is better, right, A or B. And then you continue to iterate in that manner, always saving a copy of your latest and greatest, so you can go back to it if your change worsens it. Um, but to be able to iterate uh, and get to the place that you want to be. Scott, you had something you wanted to So I, we have a bunch of USF students here tonight, and I know it could be a little intimidating to ask questions in front of a big group of like older grown-up people. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see if there are any questions specifically from USF students while well, well, Cole is here to give in. Thank you for your talk, it's so good. And yeah. what I'm thinking is, so I didn't see any like animation or interaction in your talk. So do you think it's important in the like, explaining the story in perspective? Yeah, it's absolutely important to explain the story in perspective. Um, one thing you point out, though, is something we should talk a little about, which is the fact that all the graphics we looked at tonight were static, yeah. right? They didn't allow exploration or interactivity. Um, there's absolutely a place for exploration and interactivity, um, especially on the exploratory side that we talked about. When it comes to explanatory, I think sometimes we think our audience wants to dig when they may be less inclined to do so, or maybe a subset would be willing to dig, but not everybody. Um, and what I like to think about when it comes to interactive is, is there a way to at least to pull out some of the meta stories or some interesting starting points for folks? So one, you get, for the people who aren't as likely to dig, they still get some benefit. And then also for the people who are more likely to dig and you're giving them the ability to do so, they've got sort of a starting point um, for when that's appropriate. It's one way to sort of marry the two, where you do a little bit of the explanatory but also allow for greater exploration. It all comes back to how you want your audience to use it and what you want them to be able to do. Um, and then with the interactive stuff especially, that's great to watch somebody do it and watch them interact because you can learn so much that way. Great question. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Hi. Yeah. First of all, uh, Eleni, this AKJA agency, uh, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, I comment, actually, I said make a comment just because the, this audience has a lot of students, and I want them to get your message right, and I want to say a word <coughs> in defense of Pycha. There is, a case, there is a case for pie chart when they are appropriate. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them ever. Like for example, if you have just two categories, nothing beat pie chart. It's easy to compare even 49 to 51, and especially on that board when you need to save space. Uh, these two categories, totally valid. I have Matrix 10 by 10 with 100 pie charts. Each has just three. Just make me die a little inside. Just, just, <laughs> each has just three categories. And my focus is not to compare absolute values on each of them, but just spot where one of the categories dominates. And it's about the, uh, uh, those rules that yep. you describe about proximity yep. or in cow. I can spot them right away. Uh, so just uh, use them carefully, but there is a place for them. Yeah, I should point out, and thank you for that, that intelligent people will disagree with me on the use of pie charts. My personal vow to myself is never to use the pie chart. They, just, they inevitably end up not quite working for what I want to show. Uh, but there may be use cases for them. We've heard about some of them tonight. With the specific exam example you started with, though, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, if you're just showing two uh, parts, yes. if one is more important than the other, and it may or may not be, you could think about just showing the number as well. Yes. Potentially. But I mean, in comparison yeah. with part charts, part charts are uh, not better than my chart. It's the same if we have just two we can continue to debate this all night. <laughs> Just do 
a continuous line, put a 50% on it, and then just do the difference between. So basically, it's almost like a stack chart, but on a horizontal, and you can see the differences. I think that's just better. And all of that is what you want your audience to be able to do, and whether this allows them to do it in a way that's going to be intuitive. I saw a hand back here. Well, let's say one last question. Okay.